join me in welcoming Adam Moorfield in creating a robust and modern democracy for all Nebraskans in the 21st century. Hopefully I can make this work right. There we go. Um, good afternoon. I guess it's almost evening now. You're probably all very hungry. And after Ronnie Green's awesome slideshow and <laughs> that compelling presentation. I, I don't know how much more I'm going to be able to do for you, but I'm going to give it a try. Um, like I said, my name is Adam Morkel. I'm the executive director and founder of Nebraskans for Civic Reform. And when I was preparing this, I was kind of wondering, how do I talk about creating a more modern and robust democracy in Nebraska in the 21st century without boring everybody to death? Um, and that was a problem for me about two or three days ago until finally um, our director of city engagement programs told me, you know, Adam, you should just tell a story. <laughs> and so instead of just telling you how we create a more modern and robust democracy in the 21st century here in Nebraska, I'm going to tell you how we got to that point and, and how we're doing it as an organization. Um, let's see. There we go. I've got this figured out. That's good. Um, so what this started out with was we were on campus. I, I'm a, I was an undergrad at the University of Nebraska here, and then I went to law school. And we were looking for ways on campus to increase turnout among students. Um, and we wanted to do it more innovatively than just going around and registering students and feeling good about that. And it's an important function. But what we wanted to do is look at the heart of why do students not vote? Um, why do students not get engaged in our democracy? And so, um, through student government, ASUN, um, we went and we looked for three different ways that we could improve and improve turnout and engage students. And we found that first, our polling place on campus was not very accessible. It was over the Devaney Center, um, which at the time, Antelope Valley wasn't really developed or anything like that yet. So it was, it was literally like walking through a jungle to try to get there. And, and then you had to like Google Maps it, but you didn't really have Google Maps then, and it wasn't all like great. And, and so, I mean, it literally took me 30 minutes to get to my polling location. So, uh, we met with the election commissioner. We had to move it from the Devaney Center to the Union. It increased turnout from the second lowest turnout at UN, or in the county to the second highest turnout in the county. Um, what we also did was we talked to Dr. Franco, the vice chancellor here, and said, can you send out a notice to students with um, the voter registration card and an absentee request card and all that stuff, you know, 30 days before the election? Absolutely. So now they send out, um, now they send out all these notices, and they hopefully still do it, um, to, to all the students before an election. What we also realized, though, with the, was that there was a deeper problem, a more systemic problem in our process. And that was that students are a unique demographic in that we are highly mobile. When I was a student, and as a resident assistant and somebody who lived in the dorms, I moved anywhere from two to three times a year. Keeping my voter registration up to date, all those things, in addition to working two jobs and going to school full time, there's some barriers there, some real barriers. And we found that in states that have election day registration, there's 14% higher turnout in those states among students that are, or excuse me, not just students, but people that are 18 to 24. So we went down to the legislature, met with a senator, he introduced some legislation for us, and that bill was killed quicker than <laughs> anything in the legislature ever before. But we realized that we could get people's attention and get their attention on the issue. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the problem. First, there's a general lack in emphasis um, in the mechanisms and mechanisms to engage our youth in, in the community. Um, a lot of what we were seeing was that there's a lot of great volunteer opportunities, but none of those volunteer opportunities were tying those opportunities to why it was important to volunteer or what kind of impact it had on the community. Also, um, there's not a lot of organizations out there that get um, leaders community leaders engage with students um, in the K through 12 um, level, or even um, post-secondary school. And then also, we were finding that a lot of people just didn't know how to get registered to vote. They didn't know where to start first. It wasn't something that they had grown up with. It wasn't something that was a part of their culture. And then a lot of times, students who are first-time voters, or people who have never voted at all, really, um, didn't really know the, the processes, that when you move from home, when you're registered in high school, when you move to um, Lincoln, Nebraska, you have to re-register. 
I mean, I'm in the same state, why do I have to re-register? Those things aren't things that people were thinking of at first, and those were the problems that we were seeing students and young people run into. However, we, often, we also often saw that it wasn't just students that this affected. This affected a lot of young professionals who move a lot, a lot of lower income folks that come from backgrounds that may have not emphasized um, civic engagement and education. And so what happened, going back to the story of how we created Nebraskans for Civic Reform, is I had the bright idea to run for student regent and, again, lost, um, which was actually a really good thing. Uh, because when you spend five or six hours a day campaigning for something for a year and then you lose, you have a lot of time on your hands. Um, so I had a lot of time to think and of you know, crazy things to do, and so I decided to start a nonprofit, um, which is excellent being as though I spent $75,000 of my legal education and I'm not using it at all anymore. Um, so, <laughs> Dean Poser's not here still, is she? No. Okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> That, that's not totally true, and I'll get to that. I, I will use my legal education a little bit. But what we decided um, was that, you know, even after um, not being involved with ASU and student government anymore, we still wanted to try to address some of these problems, solve some of these engagement problems. Why aren't people engaged in voting? Why aren't people getting out there and, and being more active in their democracy? And so we started a nonprofit. It was called Nebraskans for Civic Reform. It was started in my dorm room in Harper Hall, I think it was room 1008. Uh, and it was really nothing more than a nice letterhead and a, a cool logo and a sweet web page that I made off of Apple.com or something. So uh, th those were our humble origins. And the idea was that we would make our elections more accessible for youth, low income, people with disabilities, and seniors. And that we would also increase civic engagement and activism among K through 12 students. And in doing so, the board of directors is, the average age is 26, it's a politically diverse group. Um, and we decided to approach the solution in two different ways. A lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofit organizations that deal with civic engagement, often deal with civic engagement in one of two ways. First, they either try to increase civic engagement in schools, K through 12, create programs to get students into the community and get community leaders with the students. And then the other type of organizations will try to make more systemic change with election law, policy, voting rights, you name it. Well, we decided in Nebraska there was no organization that was doing either of those, really. And so our first approach is approaching the front end issue, which that's a civic engagement and education issue. We have to create a culture of civic engagement, where not only is it something you do to put on your resume to get into a college, but it's something you do because you want to, because it's meaningful. And in order to do that, you have to expose children and youth at an early age to it. We were finding that in the schools they have great civic education programs, good, good curriculum. But what they didn't have was a mechanism to make the rubber meet the road. They didn't have the capacity and the time in order to recruit community leaders, provide them an orientation of where they would fit into the civic engagement and civic education curriculum. We found that there also wasn't a lot of capacity for these schools to create unique partnerships with nonprofits, governmental entities, and religious organizations that do great social work in the community. So we decided as an organization we would provide that capacity. We would use AmeriCorps members to go out and make these connections with nonprofits, recruit community leaders. For instance, in our LPS program, we have all seven state Lincoln state senators on board, including city councilors, youth leaders, um, you name it. And we coordinate their schedules. They go into the classrooms at specific times in the curriculum where these students are working on their service learning projects. And these service learning projects are then um, created through partnerships that we create with different nonprofits in the community. Because ninth graders are kind of a unique group in that they're high schoolers, they're kind of almost becoming adults, but oftentimes they don't have cars. <laughs> and they have transportation issues. So we have to create unique service learning programs that are number one, meaningful. Number two, that they actually learn something from. So they're not just going and sweeping the floor or cleaning up a park or, or doing something like that. They're learning why that, that matters, why that's meaningful. And so, our first civic engagement program actually started at LPS. It's in 15 classrooms a semester. Um, we're piloting it. 
Um, it's with ninth grade civics students, and uh, it's going to reach, I think, about 300 students. Um, and it's the first of its kind in, in the sense that it's really a, a more robust way of getting students engaged in the community in, in the sense that we are engaging community leaders with the students as civic engagement mentors and then engaging the students in the community with nonprofits that are not only having them great, do great service learning work, but also teaching them the importance of it. A lot of people come up to me and say, Adam, why doesn't your organization do a huge voter registration drive? I mean, you can get a half a million dollars and hire a bunch of people and you can go register a bunch of voters. Well, for me, it doesn't matter how many people we register. If they don't understand the importance of voting, if they don't engage in the critical thinking skills that lead to the decisions that they make in the ballot box. And so that's the purpose of our K-12 civic engagement programs, and that's how we address the front-end problem with civic engagement. Now, the second approach. This is the approach that is often somewhat controversial, because we deal with policy and election policy in general. And whenever you deal with election policy, if anybody's even seen the voter ID debate across the country, you kind of walk into a landmine, um, even if you're a nonpartisan organization with a bipartisan board of directors. Um, and so what we were finding um, on campus and what we found through election day registration was that there are real barriers to people with voting, um, particularly youth, low income, and young professionals that move around a lot. Um, they often don't get registered in time. They often uh, show up to the polls and they find out, huh, you're registered in three or four counties over. It's going to be a two or three hour car ride. Most people don't have five or six hours out of the day to go vote. And so they, they get turned away. I saw that as an election judge. I was an election judge for the first year that uh, the polling place was at the City Union campus. I turned away 50 students. 50 students from that polling location that realized that they were registered in a different part of the state or in a different state entirely. So when people tell me, oh, students don't care, students are lazy, no, these people registered. They just didn't understand the process. And we learned that things like election day registration that eliminates unnecessary barriers to voting has real effects on real people. And it has a real effect on the representativeness of our democracy. We also advocate for things like online voter registration. In Arizona, 90% of people register online. Um, it actually saves a lot of money and it keeps it makes it easier for people to keep their registration up to date and be engaged in the process. The big thing that we did this last session was voter ID. Um, most people, unless you're kind of living under a rock, have heard of voter ID and what's going on with it. Um, I could talk for three hours on voter ID, but I, I'll, I'll spare you um, <laughs> the, the, the conversation on that. But I, the, the real thing with voter ID was that um, it's a highly partisan issue, but it really shouldn't be. It wasn't a partisan issue on our board of directors. It was a no-brainer. What's the problem? Voter impersonation. You're two to three times more likely to get struck by lightning than being impersonated at the polls. Um, in addition, um, if voter impersonation was going on, we would know about it because we have a high sample size, particularly in the presidential election, um, where 80% of the people show up to the polls, and you don't hear stories of people going, oh, I was turned away because I was impersonated. Um, and so... The, the, that's kind of the, the thing with voter ID, and, and I'm about ready to get on my soapbox, but you know, anytime I go into a classroom, um, I always ask students, and this is something people don't realize with voter ID, is that it requires a very specific form of identification, your current address. I have five forms of ID in my pocket right now that have my picture on it. None of them would be valid under a voter ID law that's been introduced in this state and in many other states. Uh, because I've moved two times in the last three years now, and I'm not going to update my ID each time. So that affects a lot of students and low-income folks. And I'm going to go to the next slide so I don't go off that soapbox. But um, these are the solutions. Um, and I've already talked about some of them. You know, creating programs in schools that engage students or engage community leaders with students and engage um, students in the community. That's vital, it's important. Studies show that students that are engaged in the community will continue to be engaged in the community. They have better academic achievement across different academic areas, um, and they're more likely uh, to go out and, and do great things and, and be engaged in the community after high school. Um, also, we were finding that there's a lot of statewide organizations that are doing really great things with civic engagement, but nobody's working together, nobody knows that they're doing it. Um, so one thing that we're doing right now is we're working to bring together 
a bunch of statewide nonprofit organizations and, uh, and governmental organizations, actually, to start looking at what's the state of civic education and efficacy in the state of Nebraska, not just K through 12, but beyond. And the, census, the United States Census actually has some really great data that's coming in the community, sur um, I can't remember what, the community something survey um, that shows civic efficacy state by state. So what we're going to be doing is we're teaming up with the National Conference on Citizenship to create a report, create this coalition, identify areas that we can work on and work together on, and then address the problem in a coordinated manner um, and increase civic um, engagement and efficacy throughout the state. Also, creating more accessible elections, really realizing and addressing that there are different limitations and people do come from different backgrounds. Um, and those backgrounds and those socioeconomic um, differences often can mean that uh, certain populations are turned away from the polls from certain um, policies. Now, what can you do? <laughs> um, I've talked a lot about what we do. Um, what you can do is get involved. And not only when you get involved, go out and take your niece, your nephew, your cousin, your son, your daughter, and get them involved and engaged. And not only get them involved and engaged, but explain why you're doing it and what it means to the community. That's such a big part of making people feel comfortable with being engaged and doing and going forth and doing it down the road. A lot of people, studies show, they just simply don't get engaged in our civic society because they don't know how. They're not comfortable. They're not comfortable going up and talking to their city councilor or their mayor or, or their state legislator. Um, get them engaged to do that. When we had people coming down to the legislature to talk about certain legislative issues, they were shocked that they can just put a note into the sergeant at arms. And their state legislator would come out and talk to them. And they'd have a meaningful conversation about whatever policy issue that they were concerned about or was affecting them. So get people out and do that. Um, also, call or email your school board members. Um, that sounds like something that's kind of trivial, but I talk to a lot of them. And a lot of them say, you know what, I don't hear from anybody that civic engagement or social studies is really a high priority. They're concerned about math, reading, writing. We need to get more people going out and telling them that it's important that our students are involved in the community. Um, and the only way to do that is to contact them. Also, if you want to learn to get involved with us, you know, please let me know. My contact information is up there. But whatever you do, make sure you do something. Because our democracy is only as strong as those that are engaged in it. Thank you.